Good morning to all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of the Judicial Training Network, um, I'm very sorry for this little delay. We had some technical issues, but now we are here, and I hope uh, you can all hear me well. So I would like to welcome you to this webinar on um, unaccompanied minors, new challenges for the civil courts, the civil law perspective in the member states. Uh, my name is Shara Shiposh, and I'm a senior project manager at the European Judicial Training Network, and I shall be your moderator for this uh, webinar. I will open and close the webinar, and um, I will hand you over later on to the presenter. Um, a few uh, tips before we start. Um, you can interact with, interact with the webinar um, through typing your questions and observations. Uh, to this end, you can see two different type of boxes. Um, the chat box, I can see that you started to get uh, familiar with that box. Um, this is for technical questions or observations. Um, if you put a comment here, everybody will see it, uh, all the participants and also uh, we, the moderators and the uh, presenter. Um, I ask uh, everyone to try this if you haven't done so, but um, I, I see many greetings from uh, Poland, Austria, um, Cyprus, um, somebody from uh, Tallinn, uh, Estonia um, is joining us today. So we have a really pan-European um, audience here, which is lovely to see. Um, then the Q&A box, um, you can see for asking questions related to the contents of the webinar. So the questions will be collected and we will try to answer as many of them as possible um, during and at the end of the, the presentation. And finally, um, we will close our webinar uh, when we are, we are going to close our webinar, you will see a URL link um, on your screens, which is leading to an online survey about the webinar. And why I'm talking about this already at the beginning is because um, it's very important, uh, would be very helpful for us if you could uh, complete this survey, um, because your feedback will help us to improve and shape uh, EJTN's future webinar program. Um, I would like to say a few words about uh, the European Judicial Training Network. Um, the EJTM brings together judicial training institutions from all European Union member states and supports the interest of over 120,000 European judges, prosecutors and judicial trainers across Europe. The aim of the network um, is to help to foster a European area of justice and to promote mutual recognition and trust between judicial systems and practitioners. But I trust that um, some of you, and I also see some names which are familiar to me, uh, already participated in some of our face-to-face um, -face trainings, which we hold um, across Europe in uh, different um, capitals of um, certain member states. Coming back to today's webinar um, on unaccompanied minors, um, new challenges for the civil courts, um, the civil law perspective in the member states, focusing on recent developments and case law. Um, I'm going to tell a few words um, what uh, we will cover um, during this session. Um, can you let me know if you can hear us? Can you type it in the chat box if you can hear us? Because I don't see anyone typing um, uh, since I started to speak. So I am a bit concerned that some of you might not be hearing me. OK, I see um, Mar Margarita Pampatoniu from uh, Cyprus is hearing us. Um, Joanna from Poland, I suppose. She can also hear us. Christian Haider can also hear us well. Excellent. Valerie, thank you for the confirmation. OK, I, I'm reassured. Eva Kreatsova from Czech Republic and with a group, because a group is joining together uh, from the Czech Republic, from Prague. They can also, they can't hear us. OK, that's, that's a pity. 
So um, we will try to fix that um, for, for them. But if I see well, uh, all the rest of the participants can hear me well. OK. Then I shall continue, um, and we try to fix for um, the group in the Czech Republic. So the increase of uh, the unaccompanied minors in the European Union in the last years is still keeping the civil courts busy. Uh, new and difficult questions have to be solved um, around this um, issue. So this webinar will provide you with an overview of the civil legal framework and offer solutions concerning practical challenges as well. Uh, the webinar will offer solutions and will show that the principle of the best interest of the child has an influence on a bunch of questions. Um, the presentation will show how, in how far European and international instruments, such as the Brussels One Bis Regulation, the 1951 Refugee Convention, and the 1996 Hague Convention on the Protection of Children, offer solutions. Now I would like to talk and share a few words about our presenter. Um, you can see her photo um, on the right top of the sc screen. So our presenter is uh, Ms. Martina Erb Klunemann. Um, Martina is a German family court judge. Um, she worked as a judge in general civil and criminal law cases at various uh, courts before her appointment as a family judge in 1996. Uh, in this capacity, she's responsible for international family conflicts pending at her court in Hamm, Germany. This is a specialized court for a district covering 9 million inhabitants. She has extensively pub published in the field uh, and acts as an expert for the Hague Conference on Private International Law um, and also at the European level. Um, she is a um, judge um, in the European Judicial Network in Civil and Commercial Matters. So she's a network judge member of the EJS Civil Network and um, in the International Hague Network of Judges, uh, as well as she co-chairs um, the Association of International Family Judges. Martina runs Europe-wide training courses on cross-border family law. Uh, for many years, she's involved in the training in cooperation in civil matters run by the European Judicial Training Network. Uh, it's correct, we ha will have a um, European Family uh, Law training next week here in Brussels, and Martina will uh, be one of our speakers. So, um, now it is my great pleasure um, to turn this webinar over to uh, Martina Erb Krunemann. So, please, Martina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. I hope that you can all hear me. So hello from, at the moment, sunny Germany to the rest of the member states and to you, colleagues. And um, sorry also from my side for the delay. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for the nice introduction. Unaccompanied minors is the, the topic, our today's topic from the civil point of view. We are not talking about asylum law. It's family law we will talk about. And I, I warmly want to invite you to, to write down your questions. You, you can't ask me directly, so we will have to get along and we will have to get used to that, but please write them down if you want already while I will give my presentation or at the end of the presentation. That's up to you and I will I will read them and I will try to answer them as good as possible. So I want to start by giving you some statistics. We all know about unaccompanied minors, the refugee in, in Europe. We, we heard it in the news. We are still hearing it in the news. But what does it mean concerning children in numbers? The numbers I give you here are from UNICEF. Worldwide, we have 50 million children in migration. One in 200 children is a refugee. One in three children living outside their country of birth is a refugee. Half of the refugee population 
are children and one in eight migrants is a child from a worldwide perspective. In the EU, the figures. At the beginning of 2018, we had more than 4% of the people living in the EU who were non-EU citizens. That means more than 22 million people in the EU. In 2017, more than 2 million immigrants entered the EU from non-EU countries. More than 5 million children migrated and are now in Europe. 2015, at the peak of the refugees coming, 31% of the refugees who arrived in the EU by sea were children. Concerning asylum applications in 2015, we can state that one in four asylum applications in the EU was done by a child. This statistic will not wonder you. We had the, the, the high peak in 2015 of asylum applications. I can't give you the, the statistics are especially detailed concerning the question of asylum. This is why I'm referring to them. So uh, many, many asylum applications by unaccompanied minors in the EU in 2015 the numbers are going down, but we are still having unaccompanied minors arriving, applying for asylum, and the unaccompanied minors who arrived before are still there, and we have um, to look for them. What are the general basic principles having regard to the unaccompanied minors. First of all, there is for all of us the Convention on the Rights of the Child that says that in all actions concerning children, the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. And the states have to ensure that children receive such protection and care as necessary for the well-being of the child. And a child without family outside the family environment shall be entitled to special protection and assistance provided by the state. The states shall take all appropriate measures that a child who is seeking refuge shall receive appropriate protection. The states shall provide cooperation to protect and assist such a child and to trace the parents. If no parents or family mem members can be found, the child shall be accorded the same protection as any other child deprived of his or her family environment. So that's the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU states very similar that children shall have the right to such protection and care as it is necessary. They, have, they may express their views and those shall be taken into consideration in matters concerning the child. And in all actions relating to children, the child's best interest must be a primary consideration. You, you already heard twice now, and you will, when we will go further on, you will hear it again several times. The repetition of the words, these children are in need of protection and care. And what is the basis for our action? the child's best interest. Very similar, a communication from the Commission to the European Parliament and the Council from April 2017 concerning unaccompanied children. Migrant children are 
in a state of particular vulnerability because of age, distance from home, often separation from parents or carers. They require specific and appropriate protections. The, the risks are higher for unaccompanied children. There is a need to protect these children, especially the most vulnerable unaccompanied minors. The principle of best interest of the child must be the primary consideration in all actions or decisions. In June 2017, the Council of Europe and the representatives of the governments of all our member states concluded that the number of children in migration arriving in the EU has increased in a dramatic way. This is no wonder we know it and has put national migration management and child protection systems in some member states under pressure. Protecting all children in migration is a priority. Member states and the Commission shall give full recognition to children as right holders and ensure respect for the principle of the best interest of the child. Here it is again. Best interest of the child must be a primary consideration in all actions. There is a need to swiftly protect children from violence, exploitation and trafficking and to quickly and reliable access their age. So the more concrete we are getting from a member state's view into the topic of unaccompanied minors, the, the more we have to state that the general principle, as I already stated, stated is always and ever the basic principle for all actions and also when I, I, I took some time to, to explain that to you because this is important to me and concerning the unaccompanied minors, this is the leading, these are the leading basic principles. If you have a look into the um, professional uh, publications, judicial publications concerning unaccompanied minors, there is a focus on asylum law. I found it typical term that says asylum and other proceedings. So our civil proceedings are these other proceedings. But nevertheless, civil law actions concerning the unaccompanied minors are very, very important. They play a vital role because they play a role to effectively protect unaccompanied minors. Although the focus is from uh, also from a judicial point of view mostly on migration law. So I'm really lucky that you take your time and that you're interested in the topic from a civil law perspective. So let's start with the civil law view on the topic of unaccompanied minors. I'll give you a case. The civil court in your member state receives the information that Amir came from Syria to your state as an unaccompanied minor and that he is in need of protection. Does the court have international jurisdiction to start proceedings on parental responsibility? We now go into a very general topic concerning international jurisdiction international family law. Whenever you are dealing with a case with a cross-border element in family law, you always have to start with a question of international jurisdiction. You will probably all know, but it's worth talking about it, especially because it's very difficult concerning unaccompanied minors. So this is our case and what is the answer? There is not one answer, there are several ones. When we are dealing with proceedings on parental responsibility, that's the technical term. Parental responsibility includes proceedings on custody and on access and 
concerning the unaccompanied minors, it's especially the topic of appointment of a guardian, but it might also be another topic having regard to parental responsibility. You will now find different rulings in different instruments. One instrument is the Brussels to Biz regulation, and the other instrument is the 1996 Hague Convention. And all our member states are contracting states of the Brussels to BIS, with the exception of Denmark. And all our member states are contracting states to the 1996 Hague Convention. Having a look at Article 8 Brussels to BIS and Article 5 of the 1996 Hague Convention, you have the text, you can see it on the, on the slide. Um, then you can state, see that the basic factor, the most important factor for our international jurisdiction in both instruments is the habitual residence. And then Article 13 of Brussels to Biz, as well as Article 6 of the 1996 Convention, they refer to situations where a child has no habitual residence, where a child is a refugee or an internationally displaced child. And in these cases, both instruments state that the state where the child is present shall have jurisdiction. The question is now, which instrument is applicable concerning our unaccompanied minors being in our state? And do they fall into the scope of 8.5, habitual residence, or 13 or 6, no habitual residence? To answer this question, we will first have to refer to the concept of habitual residence. You always, while deciding on the question whether you have international jurisdiction, you always have to start with the question of habitual residence of the child. And it's important to note that the status of being a refugee does not exist automatically exclude the child from establishing an habitual residence. That means this child in our case might already have an habitual residence in your state. And then the general rules of international jurisdiction because of habitual residence are applicable. Or your conclusion is no habitual residence, then the rulings for the other children without habitual residence being refugee are applicable. To, to answer the question whether a child has an habitual residence, I have to state that this is often complicated. You will find no de definition, not in Brussels to Biz, not in the 1996 convention. You have to interpret the technical term of habitual residence not with your national knowledge, because each international and EU instrument is in need, has to be interpreted autonomously and in a uniform way. What does that mean? We do have judgments of the European Court of Justice concerning habitual residence in the sense of Brussels to Biz, because this is the EU instrument the ECJ is ruling on. And uh, what does the European Court of Justice say? I put it in at the end of my slide. You can see that I put it in the most important decisions in so far, and you can all find them in the internet to have a deeper look into these decisions. To sum them up, we can say habitual residence means some degree of integration of a child in a social and family environment. The ECJ always hints at the point that 
the decision always depends on the circumstances of the individual case. And you know there is not one case that resembles the next one. What are the aspects you have to refer to? In particular, the physical presence of the child. If a child is not physically present in a state, the child cannot have an habitual residence there. This is especially underlined in the news decision of the European Court of Justice. The duration of the stay of the child in that state, the regularity, conditions and reasons for the stay on the territory and the family's move to that state, also the child's nationality, but please do not put too much, much emphasis on nationality because this is no longer the leading factor. The place and conditions of attendance at school and kindergarten, the linguistic knowledge, does the child speak the language, the family and social relationships of the child in that state. That means that you have to put, have a look, having regard to all these different aspects at the individual situation of that child. And then you have to decide whether this child, our unaccompanied minor, already has an habitual residence or not. I want to, to, to add that there is a possibility of no habitual residence, especially concerning an unaccompanied minors, and a child might also have several habitual residents in different states. So, which instruments do you have to apply? If your result is that the child has an habitual residence, then you have to distinguish if this habitual residence of the child is in a member state of Brussels to Biz, that means all EU member states with the exception of Denmark, and the UK is still in, then it's Article 8 of Brussels to Biz that you have to apply. And then the, the member states where the habitual residence of the child is has international jurisdiction. If your result is that the, the child has an habitual residence in a contracting state of the 1996 Hague Convention that is not a member state, you have to understand that because all our member states of the Brussels to this are also contracting states of the 1996. But for us member states of Brussels to Biz, the Brussels to Biz always prevails. But if the child has an habitual residence in a contracting state of the 1996 Hague Convention that is not a member state, then the 1996 Hague Convention is applicable, Article 5. I give you an example. If the child has an habitual residence in Austria, member state of Brussels to Biz, it's Article 8, Brussels to Biz. If the child has an habitual residence in Switzerland, not a member state of Brussels to Biz, but a contracting state of the 1996, then it's Article 5 of the 1996 Hague Convention that is applicable. Always with the same result, Habitual residence, if it is given, then this state has international jurisdiction. If the child has an habitual residence, finally, in another state that is not a member state of Brussels to Biz and not a contracting state of the 1996 Convention, then Article 14 Brussels to Biz is applicable plus your national law. What is the answer concerning international jurisdiction if the refugee or international 
forcibly displaced child has no habitual residence. If this is your result, having regard to all the aspects I mentioned, then you have to distinguish it again. So really, sorry, it's very complicated. If the last habitual residence of that child was in a member state of Brussels to Biz, then Article 13 of Brussels to Biz. If the last habitual residence of the child was in another state or you cannot establish the last habitual residence, then it's Article 6 of the 1996 Hague Convention. I told you the result is nearly the same. Habitual residence, Article 8, Article 5, it's always habitual residence that defines international jurisdiction. If no habitual residence, Article 13, as well as Article 6, 1996 Convention, state that it is the state where the child is present that has jurisdiction and to distinguish the different instruments is complicated. I showed you the way. Let's go into another case because I do not see a question from you till now. There is the child Murat in your state. He's arguing that he came from Morocco as an unaccompanied minor. His father is dead, his mother is still in Morocco and was not informed about him going to your state. This is a real case. I was confronted with that such a boy who, who gave me, who was in front of me in the family court for, as an unaccompanied minor and he, that was the, his story, the story he told me. So my first question was, do the courts of my state have international jurisdiction to deal with proceedings? I give you the additional information that Morocco is a contracting state of the 1996 convention. The question is now, the 1996 convention refers to refugee children. Is this boy a refugee in the sense of Article 6 of the 1996 Hague Convention, which is applicable because his last habitual residence was in a contracting state, Morocco, and he hasn't yet established a new habitual residence? The question is the definition of a refugee. There is an explanatory report by Lagarde that is always worth having a look at when you have questions concerning the 1996 convention, a convention, and the link is mentioned. Lagarde says, this paragraph, Article 6, concerns refugee children and children who, due to disturbances occurring in their country, are internationally displayed limited to those who have left their countries because of conditions which were arising there and who often are not accompanied and are temporarily or definitively deprived of their parents. It does not concern the other children who have been internationally displaced, such as runaway or abandoned children for whom other provisions of the convention should permit a solution to be found. That means in my case with that boy who told me that he is or was a runaway child, his mother didn't know it. He is not a refugee in the sense of Article 6 of the, of the Hague Convention. So this provision did not apply to him. Of course, there are often difficulties in practice to distinguish whether the child in front of you who is telling you I'm unaccompanied, uh, that's my story, 
Is this child a refugee or is it a runaway or abandoned child? Often they will not tell you and you have no, really no possibilities to check it. But in this case, he told me and uh, that was my judicial result that he didn't fall into the scope of the Article 6, 1996 Hague Convention. Once you have stated that the courts of your state have international jurisdiction, the next question is, does your court have local jurisdiction? This answer is easy. This is ruled by the national law of your member state. In some member states, it's the general civil court. In some, it's the general family court. Some member states have specialized courts. Let's get now into some topics concerning unaccompanied minors that are that are typical that often occur in practice. The identification of the child. Who is that child in front of you? What is the name of that child? The child will often tell you, I do not have documents or they arrive with, with uh, photos taken from whatever sorts of documents and they show it to you on their mobile phones but documents are mostly lacking. What is the name of the child? How do you write? How do you spell the name of the child? What is the date of birth? Does the child know? Does it give he or she give you a date of birth? Is this the correct date of birth? He, those who are more dealing with unaccompanied minors will know that we have states in which the date of birth is not important for a state. So in the state, there is nobody registering the date of the birth and there is no birthday party because this is not of no relevance. The other question is, what is the actual custodial situation of that child? Is it under custodial care of parents or one parent or is it somebody else? Many questions who need practical solutions. And what you have to keep in mind from my point of view at the end is always the benefit of the doubt principle. That means whenever after checking you don't know it, you can't get more information on that, then best interest of the child is always the relevant factor that decides. That means, for example, if you don't know the date of the birth, but you know that the child was born in, let's say, in 2010, but you don't know which month, with which date, but the year is clear, then never say it's January 1st. Benefit of the doubt principle, best interest of the child, it's the last day in December. The question of personal status of our unaccompanied children, that means name, legal competence, age of consent, rights attaching to marriage, the legal age, the validity, the divorce, is ruled by Article 12 of the Geneva Convention relating to refugees, I will call it refugee convention. Now, that means concerning these questions, you will have to check whether you have to apply Article 12 of the refugee convention, or if not so, you have to apply your national private international law. 
One important topic in so far why this is of highest relevance is the question of legal competence. When, what is the end of being a minor? It is not automatically our law that says once, once they reach the age of 18. It might be the law of the state where they come from. And now it's really getting complicated. And I was on a conference where with academics and practitioners where we talked about it because you will now have to distinguish article 12 says if somebody is a refugee then the personal status is governed by the law of the country of domicile or residence so new technical terms now it's no longer a bit residence as we as we had concerning international jurisdiction now the, the leading factors here are domicile and residence and rights previously acquired by a refugee shall be recognized by the law of that state. That means if the child, our unaccompanied child, comes from Syria and or he comes from let's take another example he comes from a state where the they are adults starting at the age of 21 there are not a lot of states where it's not 18 but there are he's coming from one of these states do you have to apply their law and this unaccompanied minors remains a minor till the age of 21 or is it the law of your state, because Article 12 Geneva Convention is applicable, this child is a refugee, he's domiciled or she, or has a residence in that state. So that has, might have a big practical impact, especially concerning that question of end of being a minor. There is a definition of the term refugee in Article 1 of the Refugee Convention. Of course, it's very easy to state whether somebody is a refugee in the sense of Article 12 of the Refugee Convention if there is already an official recognition as a refugee. But this is more theory. In practice, these children are regularly in front of us while nobody already decided on the question of refugee recognition. What do you have to do then? You have to assess that within your proceedings on parental responsibility. Is this a child in the sense a refugee child in the sense of the Article 12 of the Refugee Convention. Very, very difficult. And Article 12 says nationality is not the connecting factor. But what are the differences between domicile and residence? We talked about that on the conference I referred to for hours. And there are different understandings of domicile and residence. Some countries, the Anglo-Saxon countries, who know domicile from their national concepts, they de define it differently than most of the continental European countries who put it a little bit like a bit rural residence. And then there is this very difficult situation. I can not really answer for you because it, it's depending on the individual case. Dublin 3 regulation with the country of reception concept. How far does this influence our decisions concerning habitual residence, domicile, residence? I just put a question mark in so far. And the backup clause I already mentioned. 
Concerning the, the procedures in the civil court, family court, concerning unaccompanied minors, this is the big topic of child-friendly justice, and this concept does, of course, also refer to our unaccompanied minors. So, information should be given to the child in a child-friendly and age- and context-appropriate way on rights, procedures, services. There is Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child giving us leading aspects in so far you can read it on the on this slide it is especially important to give a short reference to interpretation these children do not mostly do not already have enough knowledge of how the language spoken in our state so we have to care for a good interpretation so that we can talk to them and they can talk to us. So these are procedural questions with a special look to unaccompanied minors. As I still do not see any questions, I would like to go on with the question of applicable law. If you have international jurisdiction and you have local jurisdiction and you know what to apply, which law do you apply? There is nothing in Brussels to biz because Brussels to biz doesn't re deal with the question of applicable law. You have to, first of all, have to check whether there are prevailing bio or multinational treaties that are applicable in your member state, which is not often the case. But I can't answer that question for all of you. You have to check that having regard to the individual situation in your member state. Otherwise, it's Article 15 of the 1996 Hague Convention that is applicable. And this is really a nice provision because it says in exercising your jurisdiction, you apply your own national law. So this is a nice and easy going provision. Once you're at that point, you can relax a little bit. As I told you, in most cases, our proceedings on parental responsibility are on the question whether we have to apply a guardian. The substantive rules insofar are totally up to your national law. There is no international or EU instrument insofar. There is a communication from the Commission to the European Parliament, the one I already mentioned from April 2017, who says, which says that guardians play a crucial role in guaranteeing access to the rights and in safeguarding the interests of all unaccompanied child children. They can help to build trust with a child and to ensure the well-being. Guardians can help prevent that children go missing or fall prey to trafficking. The Commission stated that there are currently major shortcomings in the functioning of the guardianship systems in some member states, particularly as regards the number of suitable qualified guardians and the speed of appointment. Guardianship institutions should be strengthened. Guardians need to be recruited in sufficient numbers, be appointed faster and be better equipped. The Commission stated there is a, that there is a need to develop and exchange good practices and guidance among guardians and guardianship authorities in our member states and a European guardianship network should be established. What happened to that? In, in the working program of last year of the Commission, 
An action grant was given to NIDOS, it's a Dutch guardianship authority, to establish and coordinate the European Guardianship Network in cooperation with the European Network of Guardianship Institutions. I didn't yet find any published results in so far. We will have to wait and see in how far they help to develop and exchange practices and guidance within our member states. Of course, the question, when do you have to apply a guardian, are ruled by the substantive law of your state. But I'm sure that the leading principle for appointing a guardian in all of our member states is the inability, in fact, of the current representatives to exercise the parental responsibility. What does that mean having regard to our unaccompanied minors? Our, the modern refugees nowadays, they travel with mobile phones. As I told you, they often have pictures from documents on their mobile phone and they often have regular contact with their parents or carers via mobile phones, via computers. Is such a representative unable to exercise parental responsibility if he or she or they are now in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Turkey or in another member state? Or is the, such a person able to exercise parental rights. This does, of course, always depends on the individual situation. But from my point of view, and many courts, at least in my country, are of the same opinion, a person who is far away in another culture, who has no idea about which decisions have to be taken for that child here? How can I evaluate it? What are the important arguments in so far? Is even if he or she has contact with the child via technical means unable to, in fact, represent the child? Some children arrive with written power of disposal, especially if they are children who, who come to your member state and they have relatives already living in the member state. And then they sometimes arrive with a written power of disposal given by the parents to that relative in our member state. Is that power of disposal enough? Or is there still a need to appoint a guardian in these cases? The opinions differ in so far. From my personal point of view, and uh, many people follow me in so far, I say that such a power, written power of disposal, is it accepted in my state? It's from Somebody who says, we are the parents of that child, we are living in Afghanistan, and which is often signed by a fingerprint. I'm sure that such a written power of disposal will not be accepted if somebody wants to open a bank account for that child, if somebody goes to the authority to ask for whatever to the administration. So from my point of view, be very cautious to state that a written power of disposal is enough and that there is a need for a guardian. But of course, it's always up to the individual case to answer that question. So you still seem to listen to me. Hope you're still able to listen to me. I don't see a question. So I will go on. This is also a very typical situation, further relocation of the unaccompanied minors. You have ongoing proceedings on parental responsibility and you receive the information that the ch child is gone. 
or alternatively you have decided on a measure of protection for that child and now you receive that information. What do you do? And does it make a difference whether the child relocated to another member state or to Switzerland? Switzerland as an example of not being a member state of Brussels to this but a contracting state of the 1996 Hague Convention. Yes, it does make differences, otherwise I wouldn't question it. So let's start with the relocation to our member state of Brussels to Biz. If you haven't yet decided and the child is gone, your jurisdiction under Article 8 of Brussels to Biz is ongoing. There is a perpetuatio furi rule. What can you do? You can ask the central authorities for a social report if you know where the child is. Now, if the child is in another member state. And there is a possibility, Article 15, Brussels to this, to transfer jurisdiction. Let's assume the child was in, in Spain and the child is now in Latvia and the child will stay in Latvia. There, it makes no, no sense to go on with the proceedings in Spain, so state, pay, Spain can check the possibilities of transfer of jurisdiction. If you have already taken a measure or another court has taken a measure for that child who now relocated further on to another member state, the measure taken in one of the member states is automatically recognized in the other member state. That means it is as good as a national decision, Article 21 of Brussels to Biz. Now the case of Switzerland, contracting state of the 1996 Hague he Convention. If the measure is not yet taken, we do not have a perpetuatio furi ruling. There is no ongoing jurisdiction. That means if the child is now in Switzerland, you can close your file. You're lacking international jurisdiction if you didn't yet decide. But you must get to know whether the child, uh, the circumstances, where is the child now? Will the child come back? Will the child remain in Switzerland? Insofar, you can also ask the center authorities for a social report. And sorry for that, I mentioned Brussels to Biz here, but it's not Brussels to Biz, it's Article 32 of the 1996 Hague Convention. And in some cases, it's also helpful to know that the 1996 Hague Convention also offers the possibility to transfer jurisdiction and also here my other mistake it's article 8 and 9 of the 1996 Hague Convention that has to be mentioned not Brussels to this. If a measure if a measure was taken in one contracting state of the 1996 Hague Convention and the child is now in another member state of that convention there is also in parallel, same as under Brussels to this, the automatic recognition of a measure, Article 23 of the 1996 Hague Convention. Now my reality check. You're dealing with the, with the proceedings you already decided or you're still checking the situation and looking for a de decision and now the information the child is gone what do you do we are dealing with a lot of missing children insofar for probably various reasons first of all it always depends on your case but don't decide too quick wait for a while they often you often after a while you often receive information where they are now and then you can use all the measures the judicial measures i just explained to you 
It is important insofar to know that there are possibilities for cross-border cooperation. It might be of big help to talk to the judges or judge who is responsible in the other state, direct judicial communication. But how do you do it? We are all allowed to contact the judge in the other member state on our own and you are warmly invited to do so. But in many cases, this is complicated. You don't know the language. You don't know how to contact the other judge. The other judge receiving such a question is not sure whether it's a judge asking or whether it is a, a lawyer or the, or the press or whoever. So to overcome these obstacles, there you can use the judicial networks that are, are available and Sarah told you that I'm one of the German network judges in the European Judicial Network, in Civil and Commercial Matters, and in the International Hague Network of Judges. In both networks, we are judges, sitting judges, who are there to help you to get in information from the other member states, general information for your case, or information that refers to the individual situation of a person having regard to proceedings in another member state. And if the information needed is should come from another member state, we use the European network. If it is from one of the other states, we can use the International Hague network and Nearly all of our member states have also designated judges to the International Hague Network. But I have to admit, concerning unaccompanied minors, I am often asked to, by judges to help them to gain information from states like Syria, Afghanistan, um, all these states uh, where most of the unaccompanied minors come from. And in nearly all of these states, we do not yet have an officially nominated international Hague Network judge. But that might change. And it's always worth asking your network judges in, the both, in both systems for support. What about, I, 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 at the beginning, I started by talking about the migration law the focus of the judicial world on migration law concerning unaccompanied minors and the importance of child and youth welfare and our work in so far. Is there an interaction between these two worlds? Is there a tension in so far? The aims are different. Migration law has the aim to control migration. Child and youth welfare has the aim to guarantee the best interests of the child. And in general, there is a primacy of the child and youth welfare. But of course, migration decisions, such as the resident status, restrictions by the residence permit, are relevant in practice for questions like accommodation, care, and assistance for that child. What is important to state that is that representation of a child should always be guaranteed. Think about what I told you at the beginning, best interests of, this, of the child, uh, duty of the states to guarantee care and protection for children. There is no interaction between child and youth welfare and migration law. On one hand side, this means a guarantee of independence. The question is, does it cause disorder? The danger is there, but we should try to avoid it in the individual case that it is that it's comes to a good result and not to a disorder, because a disorder is not in the best interest of the child. So this is what I wanted to tell you concerning unaccompanied minors. 
and you probably heard and might think that it is really complicated because in some concerning some topics we have to deeply have to go into private international law concerning that questions and concerning some other topics there is a need for practical solutions in the individual case so that at the end it's always a challenge when you're dealing with these questions and hopefully my lecture was of some or still is of some help for you. Let me finish by giving you a hint to additional information and if you Google approaches to unaccompanied minors following status determination in the EU plus Norway, you will find a very interesting EU-wide study from last year on that topic. So thanks a lot for your attention attention and let's see what your reaction is and I'm open to questions now so whatever you want to ask feel free thank you Martina for the very interesting presentation and as you mentioned um, there is um, some time left now uh, for your questions in case uh, you would like to ask anything from Martina regarding uh, the topic, um, regarding um, the information she shared, uh, please I encourage you to, to type your questions uh, in, the, in the box. Well, I will wait another minute, um, and if there are no questions coming in, um, then you can also always um, send it via email uh, to me, and I will forward it to Martina. But, um, okay, somebody is typing. And of course, you you're not only allowed to, to write in questions, you can also give comments on everything I said. Um, okay, um, I, I think Christian is um, giving us just a comment about um, that she appreci he appreciated the presentation and had some te technical issues. Okay, then I, um, I will close um, this webinar on, um, on accompanied minors. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for being with us. Um, I would like to remind you um, that um, when leaving the webinar, please do not forget to complete the evaluation because this feedback is helping us to um, shape future webinars. You will also receive an email uh, with the link uh, for the evaluation, have you had to leave uh, the room earlier. Um, so, and another important point that I uh, we will uh, put um, the link uh, to this webinar uh, on our uh, website, on the EJTN website, and of course you can also find it directly on EJTN's uh, YouTube channel. Um, so if you did not have um, the possibility to hear everything, as some of uh, some of you reported some technical issues, or you would like to share a word about this among your colleagues, um, you can find it uh, from um, next week. We will uh, put. Um, the recordings. So thank you all. Um, we wish you a pleasant afternoon and hopefully um, see you in person or 
um, hear you in another or <laughs> meet you um, in another um, EJTN event, whether this is a face-to-face -face training or a webinar. So thank you very much and goodbye.